Yo, what's going on, everybody? It's BJN Radio, episode number 387. I'm Jimmy Kemsky from PhillyVoice.com. With me, as always, is Brandon Lee Gowton of Booting Green Nation. We're going to get into what the Eagles brass discussed at the NFL owners meetings in Orlando, Florida this past week. Uh, Nick, Howie, and Jeffrey Lurie all spoke. Jeffrey Lurie, of course, of course, only speaks like once a year. Uh, very rarely more than that. Uh, we hear from Howie enough, and we certainly hear from Nick enough, but Jeffrey Laurie, once a year thing, so always interesting to hear what he has to say in sort of his quote-unquote State of the Eagles uh, address, if you will. But before we get to all that, Brandon, mm. where can I, if, I, if I were looking for the finest meat snacks in the land, where should I go? I think you should go to... As you see on the screen here, if you're watching us on the Bleeding Green Nation YouTube page, which, by the way, uh, subscribe, hit the bell notification for notifications for new videos. And also, most importantly, not most, sorry, most importantly, but in, in addition to those things, leave us a like. And if you're not going to subscribe or anything or do that, which we hate you if you don't, uh, it costs you nothing to just leave a like. Just hit the like button. Anyway, uh, you can go to righteousfelon.com and use discount code BGN15 as you see here on the screen to get 15% off the best highest quality meat snacks in the land and it is as good of a time as ever to go get some so once again discount code BGN15 at righteousfelon.com same discount code works at wildrangerpet.com for 15% off dog treats all right so owners meetings not a ton to come from that, you know, nothing, you know, overwhelmingly uh, interesting from any of the press conferences, but um, there was some overlap between you know, some of the things that Howie and Jeffrey said. And I think the first thing that I kind of want to get to is, and, you know, we're, we're sort of creatures of the moment too. So a lot of the talk was about what they did in free agency, of course. Um, whereas with Jeffrey, we kind of got into a lot of like, you know, 60,000 foot view stuff, but also he got some questions about, you know, sort of the direction of the team in the short term. And of course, Saquon Barkley came up mm. and, um, you know, Howie and Jeffrey, their comments kind of echoed each other. Like Howie called him a special player. Jeffrey Lurie called him a special player. Um, Howie alluded to the idea that the running back market had become so undervalued that maybe that was uh, something to attack this off season. Jeffrey Lurie kind of said the same thing. Uh, they also both kind of, tried to make it make it seem like they hadn't like you know just avoided paying running backs in the past or you know uh, using you know premium resources on on running backs in the past and that's where I'll disagree with them like certainly yeah. they have not <laughs> used premium resources on running backs like come on they they rarely ever take one high the highest one they've taken in the draft in recent years was uh, Saquon Bar or <laughs> Saquon Miles Sanders. I think they actually drafted Miles Sanders and LaShawn McCoy, if I'm not mistaken, in the same draft slot. They were both in the 50s. I know that at least. Um, but, and you know they paid Brian Westbrook once upon a time. They paid LaShawn McCoy once upon a time. And the other thing they agreed with on the the other thing they agreed with in terms or the the other things they kind of brought up unprompted on their own was that they expect though they'll pay running backs if they're also a factor in the run game mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, I'm sorry in the pass game. Which is what they expect from Saquon Barkley, which was which they certainly got back in the day from Brian Westbrook, and maybe to a somewhat lesser degree, but he was a factor in the passing game too. And LaShawn McCoy, so they think uh, Saquon can be a factor in the passing game, you know, not just as a receiver, but also in pass protection. You can keep him on the field for all three downs. Uh, you can keep him on the field in any situation, and um, you know he's a, he's a guy that is going to be able to break more tackles for you also on the early downs. I think one of the areas where they struggled last year was in their four minute offense where they weren't able to kind of just put teams away. Uh, two examples being the Seahawks game, uh, the Cardinals game could have put those two games away in the four minute offense, just couldn't. And then gave those teams a chance to to win it. And they did. So uh, yeah, that, that, and that's something they didn't do a lot of in 2021 and 2022 when they were able to put teams away, they weren't able to do that at the end of the year last year. So I think Saquon is a guy they, they believe can be, a, a high impact player for them. And, you know, I think they're kind of right on the point where the running back market became so devalued league wide. I mean, certainly there's some teams that did throw big resources at running like Falcons took 
Bijan Robinson eighth overall last year that the Lions took Jameer Gibbs in the early teens. I want to say they were like 14th, 15th, something like that overall in, in last year's draft, somewhere in that, in that area anyway. Um, so it's not like it's not like every team in the league is kind of operating that way. But I do think that certainly in free agency last year, we saw running backs get nothing. And then this year there was, I think uh, you know, other teams around the league kind of maybe felt the same way as the Eagles. Cause it was crazy. Like the first day or two of free agency running backs, boom, 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 boom. Like one after the next going off the board uh, earlier than a lot of more premium positions like cornerback, for example, uh, those guys didn't start coming off the board until much later. So um, yeah, it's, it's maybe uh, teams have seen, you know, uh, teams around the league with, with the really good running backs have success offensively partly because of like, and you know, when you talk about like one of the best running backs in the league, like Christian McCaffrey, you know, it's kind of a hard to match that level of player. Uh, but, you know, certainly teams have had success with, with the run game this year. And some of them, you know, had deep playoff runs. So um, I kind of get it. And I've kind of been a big fan of the, of the Saquon Barkley mm-hmm. signing all along you less. So um, I'm just curious what you thought about their comments about Saquon. I don't think the, like, the thought process there is as objectionable to me as I just wonder if Saquon is truly the player that people think he is. I Mm -hmm. think the idea of Saquon is a little bit better than the reality of him. And I know, you know, again, don't need to relitigate the whole thing because we kind of covered this in our last podcast when we did the free agency review. But uh, I know he's going to benefit from being here as opposed to the Giants and everything. But I do think there's a little bit of overrating going on and that and people use that word or that feels like a dirty word to use sometimes because I think it becomes like synonymous with this player sucks. That's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Like you can be an amazing player, but if someone you could be the best player uh, on a team, but if someone says you're a hall of famer and you're not, well then you're overrated. Like that's like how the term overrated use, like you're being made up to be something you're not. Uh, and I think, you know, Saquon is still a good player for sure but they're paying him like an elite level running back. And I don't know that he's quite that anymore. Um, I really, uh, yeah, the the logic is fine. I did like hearing from Saquon on uh, the new Heights show, you know, obviously with Jason Kelsey and Travis Kelsey. I hadn't listened to that yet. How was he on that? Pretty good. Um, You can see how, I think it's a little funny how gun shy he is when it comes to like saying anything that uh, can be, even perceived as like a slight to the giants. And I get it. You don't want to necessarily insert yourself in that kind of stuff potentially, but it's also like, I don't know. You can't just say everything is taken out of context. Like sometimes you say something and it's a slight against the giants or whatever. Yeah. And it's just a slight because you know, players like to do that in general. They're like, Oh, I just got taken out of context. It's like, you didn't get taken out of context. You just didn't like the reaction to what it is that you said. You didn't like the reaction. Any case, um, so I, you know, it's a little rabbit ears kind of thing going on with him, but for the most part, I thought that was good. Um, it is kind of funny to think about how different the Eagles running back outlook is compared to last year, just in terms of like, even in training camp, we didn't know going into training camp. We didn't know who was going to get the most carries for this team. Right. Uh, you know, there was, and even in the last off season, uh, we thought Rashad Penny was going to play a big role or a role. He played none <laughs> yeah. basically right. all year. Uh, so it is kind of different, and I think it's different than the Eagles have been in a long time in terms of how they're going to operate with Saquon. I mean, I think you mentioned that uh, he got compared to, to the AJ Brown thing, where he's going to be a focal point of the offense. He's going to be uh, taking. He's going to be the, like, the Eagles haven't had really like a twenty uh, touch running back per game kind of guy in a long time. I think he's going to be that kind of guy. Um, that's what you're paying him for. That's why you're bringing him in here. That's what he profiles to be. I'm sure Kenny Gainwell will mix in, you know, because the coaching staff loves him way too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, as Nick Sirianni talked about, oh, he didn't say that, but he, he talked he talked him up a little bit when he asked about the running back room there. So I'm sure, you know, Kenny Gainwell still going to have a role. Everyone likes to make the joke that uh, they're going to bring in Kenny Gainwell in the red zone and take Saquon out after like Saquon has an awesome run or an awesome drive. Everyone like likes to do that, um, <laughs> which. Not totally unfair, I think, for yeah. people to uh, question the the usage of these players. But, yeah, I mean, it's obvious that Saquon's going to be a big part of this team, a big part of this offense, but I think their comments really hit that or drove that point home. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Giants part about Saquon being apprehensive about saying anything that could be construed negatively. Um, 
Jeffrey Lurie, not as much. <laughs> I don't know if he caught this during during his press conference. He didn't, he didn't mean it. I'm sure he did not mean to to slight the Giants. He was probably just talking up his own team and the players on on you know his own offense. But he's like, yeah, Saquon comes here and he gets to play with a better quarterback, better skill position player players, better offensive line. <laughs> they basically just crapping all over the the Giants. You know, crappy off crappy offense. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that they've had over the last half decade or whatever, six years, seven years, six years, I think, however long mm-hmm. uh, Saquon's been there. <laughs> and so I thought that was very funny that he did that. On the Kenny Gainwell note, I also thought it was funny that uh, like during the Nick presser, he he was talking about how tough a player Kenny is. And mm-hmm. then he kind of tried to give an example. They didn't really sell very well. He was just like, against the Rams, uh, he had like, I guess in pass protection, like his his – you know, part of the game plan was for him to always have eyes on on Aaron Donald, make sure that he he didn't you know wreck the mm-hmm. game or anything like that uh, if he got through the line or whatever. And he's like, in that game, he had a chip on the edge. It wasn't even down. I don't even think he was there talking about Aaron Donald. It was he had a chip on the edge, and then then he caught a pass in the flat, and then that was it. <laughs> that was the, that was- yeah, I need to look up that stat. I for, I totally forgot to like look up the stat. What was that like a catch for no gain? Like, <laughs> and that was it. That was that was the end of that anecdote. He chipped a guy and then he went wow. out to the flat and caught a pass. And that was like that was the wow. end. Of the, Who else could do that? That was the end of the example of how tough he is. But you're right. He, uh, you know, I think Kenny Game Mobile will still play some kind of role. I don't know what they'll do in terms of, you know, bringing back Boston Scott or not. He's still on the open market, or if they just go in a different direction. Um, I wonder how much the new kickoff rules will play into. Mm you know, who they sign or whether they bring back Boston Scott or whatever. Um, I haven't really wrapped my head around that whole thing yet, but um, yeah, Saquon Barkley, they believe, they believe in highly. Uh, they obviously think he's uh, a, like they, they use, they both use the word special. So um, like you said, he's going to be a guy. And he, like, I think how he even said, like, if you get a guy that's going to, you know, potentially touch the ball 300 times in a season, yeah. That guy can it's gonna have a big impact on your team, you know, either positive, neg- negatively, sure. whatever. If you have a guy, and he said, you know, hopefully touch the touch the ball 300 times in in, in a season. Well, right. That's um, part of the issue or yeah, the worry. Right, right. Whether he can stay healthy and durable or whatever, and and whether you get leads and stuff like that, and you want to give the ball to your back quite a bit. But it's kind of right. Like, I would would I take a, a B. John Robinson eighth overall, tenth overall? Hell no, because they just don't have very much just have such short shelf lives. But if you're just spending a little, like a little bit of extra money on a running back that you think can be, you know, big factor for you over the course of three years, and we'll see how long, you know, he's he remains an effective player. He's 27, which is young in NFL years, but older in terms of NFL running back years. Um, so we'll see, you know, what he can be in 2025 and 2026. Um, but paying a guy like mid-level it's not even a ton of money like it's what 12 million a year which isn't crazy money compared to you know some other guy you might sign a safety at 12 million and not you know blink choice at it uh and you, in theory you know you're not in theory but your running back is probably going to affect games a hell of a lot more than a safety will and it's not the same as like you know paying the rams playing todd Gurley, for example uh, like 14 or 15 million a year when they did it. But when they did it, it was 2018 when the salary cap was 80 million less than mm-hmm. it is. So like the percentage of the cap that was going to him was probably closer to like, you know, like nine, 10%, you know, eight, nine, 10% somewhere in there. Whereas, you know, Saquon's going to account for like five uh, on this Eagles team. So um, I don't think it's a, it's a crazy contract by any stretch. And, you know, if he plays at a special level, he'll be more than worth it. If he doesn't, then probably not worth it. Hashtag analysis. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do think they that they now have. The other thing I, I should note too, by the way, really not that many good running backs in the league right now. How many yeah, are there? That you is know? true. I so I was talking to someone, um, my good friend Holden, because I you know he, he knows I don't like love the Saquon thing. When he's like, because I I said like, and I even said here earlier, I just don't think I don't know if he's an elite back anymore. And he's like, well, who is? And I'm like, like how many how many running backs would you have over Saquon? And I'm like. It's a fair point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say like Nick Chubb. I would say sure. um, Christian Chris, McCaffrey. Of obviously, course. Christian. That yeah goes without saying. Um, I'd have to look through like specifically. Mm-hmm. I'm not also just like you know rattling these names off the top of my head. But to a larger point, the fact that I can't like come up with like you know ten off the bat kind of kind of is a fair point. Yeah, DeAndre Swift was fifth in the NFL in rushing last year. Mm. So 
I, you know, I it was kind of yeah. like a down year, though. I feel like, right? Like, kind of for running backs in general, like in yeah. general. Obviously, not CMC aside. It was yeah. He like barely that. topped. He barely got over a thousand yards. And then yeah. even Miles Sanders, I think, was like he was in the top yeah. five at least last year. I think he had what like twelve hundred something yards. Last you mean year? the year before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Not not this past year, but in twenty twenty two with the Eagles, he had like twelve hundred something yards. I believe. I think he was top five in the NFL. DeAndre Swift top five this year. So, <laughs> you know, like Saquon Barkley's. For sure, better than Miles Sanders, and and in my opinion, for sure, better than DeAndre Swift as well. So, I don't know. We'll see. I think it, it, it adds a new element. And like I said during one of the last podcasts, um, uh, taking a, a quote sort of from our good friend Bounty Bowl Gabe, um, in the Eagles are like for fans, like the Eagles are their favorite TV show. Mm -hmm. and i think saquon barkley also just makes the team more fun to watch yeah i think that could be true uh the game well reception was for seven yards by the way that was <laughs> <laughs> well, the dynamic but play. along the way he choke slammed a guy he suplexed a guy and he, he he dropped he drop kicked the guy and then that's when he went down i think it was chris clemens who choke slammed Tavares jackson yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You remember yeah that was an yeah, awesome on the, on the awesome. asante samuel pick six uh yeah. against the uh vikings that was an awesome no uh, i'm sorry yeah yeah the vikings yeah yeah awesome that's an awesome wrestling move it's great an all-time wrestling move great move the jokes it's, it's so fake like, you can't grab someone by their throat and pick them up. <laughs> yeah and you can <laughs> see the guy that's getting choked on you can see him like dip yeah. down and, and just uh, jump yeah. as high as he can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it looks so cool and it's so fun it's such a fun <laughs> to me it's always a fun move uh <laughs> wrestlemania 40 coming up in philly here very soon i think uh next weekend so Interested to see. I bet you there's an Eagles angle to that. I bet you there's like, you know, Lane Johnson is there. You know what I mean? Or Jason Kelsey is there. Like, I bet you there's an Eagle at least like in attendance in the front row or something. And I wouldn't be shocked if they like mix one in. To the... Like they run into the ring and they jack someone up. Right. And then run you out. Know, right. Or yeah, some, something like that. Yeah. I bet you there's some yeah. kind of like Eagles because it's in Philly. I bet you there is. I bet you there's, there's some kind of Eagles tie in at some level. Or they, you know, he's like Lane Johnson standing next to uh, some wrestler while they're cutting a promo or, you know, or so something. I bet you there's some kind of inclusion like that. Anyway, uh, something to watch out for if you care. Uh, what else we got, Jimmy? Next thing. I think this was really interesting, actually. This, this is a really interesting thing that I think came out of the owners' meetings uh, in an otherwise eh kind of a, uh, trio of press conferences but howie mm -hmm. was asked about the additions of cj gj and devin white uh more specifically on the angle in which you know they're looking for more swagger and more like toughness uh to add to the defense and he was asked if you know that was partly what they were looking for in terms of adding players to the defense. And he, he said, yeah, like he basically acknowledged that. Yeah, they were. And I'll read the quote. He said, obviously we want talent with those guys, but I think that's accurate to say. Um, Cause the question was about that. Uh, we were looking to regain our swagger mentality back. And obviously what happened at the end of the year didn't feel good and wasn't really acceptable for any of us. And so we wanted to get players who can kind of bring that and have that motivation and mentality. Now, for me, I look back at that 49ers game mm. where before that game happened, they're doing their DB drills. I saw this coming, so I started taking video of it. I could see something brewing, <laughs> so I started taking video of it. And uh, the 49ers just walked right through their defensive backs drill, and they didn't do a, a damn thing about it. Nothing. They just let it happen, just kind of. They, they looked, I mean, they were intimidated, I think, by the 49ers mm. when they came into Philly this year. And they got their asses kicked on the field, and they got embarrassed, in my opinion, before the game started when that happened. CJ GJ's in that defensive back line. No way there's not a fight before that game starts. And then Devin White, I don't I didn't really know him to be that kind of player because mm -hmm. I mean I've seen him play quite a bit, and I know like what he is as a player. Like he's fast and he runs around and he's you know kind of an undersized guy or whatever. Um, and you know, he's feisty or whatever, but I didn't know him to be sort of like um like a, a swagger a tone like like, yeah, tone setter kind of guy, but I guess he is because um, he was part, you know, part of that example as well. But yeah, it is interesting that they acknowledged, first of all, that they needed to improve in that area, that they needed those kinds of guys back in their defense and um, and they did something about it. So I, I found that very interesting that that they felt that they're and they're, I mean, it's easy for us and anyone else to see that, they, that sure. their defense had no swagger whatsoever. 
the guys not not celebrating sacks together, guys not celebrating any kind of plays or anything like that together. It was just a weird vibe by that defense where they were just kind of going play by play, even when they were playing okay at times. You just kind of didn't see the mm. like the exuberance that you saw out of that unit in 2022. So they wanted to get back to that, obviously, but it is interesting that they felt that way as well and wanted to change it. Well, an offense too, really. Not that you know True. the signing those guys helps the offense, but just as a whole team kind of point. Uh, and I think something that you would like to see more, you know, when Jalen Hurts has been talked about in that regard, like it's like look like you're having fun, like especially when we've seen examples of Eagles teams in the past that did do that. Obviously, the 2017 team coming to mind mm-hmm. with all their celebrations, like it might sound a little silly, and it's not as simple as like, well, hey, if the Eagles celebrate more on their touchdowns and they get into a pregame fight. Like do they beat the 49ers? If CJ GJ is there and gets starts a pregame fight, like, no, I don't think so. Um, because that's not like, that's not the reason they lost the game, but right. I get to a point of, uh, you know, swagger and mentality is certainly part of it. And there's, I think something to be said for how I was thinking about, look at the teams that CJ GJ has been on throughout his career, or at least the defenses he's been on. And even the Lions last year, like there's there's been good vibes on those teams. And now, look, mm-hmm. I think it could go the other way, too, where um, you had CJ GJ to like a kind of a volatile environment. And that might not be the best thing necessarily. I don't think that's always just I don't think swagger and all of that is like at unchecked is always good. No matter what, always a positive. It's a, it's a tool. I think in the toolbox that when used in the right way can really be important and effective. And you know, I don't think you want to build a defense entirely out of people like-minded of CJGJ that might be a little (laughs) too much Um, but having some of those guys in the mix I think is certainly uh, a formula for success and it's not to me it's not the most important thing about that signing you know the most important thing about that signing to me is like his versatility and the fact that he has playmaking ability like I value those things more ultimately but is that part of the package which I think matters yeah I think it, it it does and I think it's uh it's good for them to admit that and maybe to a point, they were missing some of that in the slide last year. They were missing some kind of – it just felt like things became toothless, right, Like as they started to continue to slide, especially mm-hmm. by the, the point of like the Giants game, which was just so pathetic. Um, maybe if you have a guy who's a little bit more fired up, that helps. Yeah. Uh, all right, next thing. Um, well, let's take a break here, Jim, Okay. and we'll get into our next thing. So we'll take a break right now, and we'll be back – after after this back here on btn radio which in addition to righteous felon craft turkey is also brought to you by wrong crowd beer company jimmy our good friends at wrong crowd beer company who you should follow by the way on instagram because they post you know new cans and releases and promos and whatnot a lot of different things going on so you can follow them at wrong crowd beer on instagram they have a new beer here that I'm going to show you from my phone. It's called Center of Our Hearts. You can see <laughs> the image there. Uh, I'm just going to say that and leave it there. They describe it as a dark, fruity, and irresistible. He's uh, wearing our... the number 62, but you, you, it's not necessarily anyone specific. That could be anyone. It that could be, be any person. Uh, it's a black IPA. It is brewed with dark roasted malt and New Zilla hops from New Zealand. It's a 7.9 mm. ABV roller coaster of citrus, tropical, and mm. stone fruit aromas. That sounds so, like right up my alley, actually. Yeah, it actually sounds really good. And our sh- shout out to our good friend Dan, who I think is going to drop some of those off soon. So we'll be having those. We'll let you know how they are. But uh, if you want to get in on it ahead of us, potentially, uh, check out Wrong Crowd Beer, especially if you're 21 plus. Uh, they're based in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And you can check out their website at Wrong Crowd Beer. What'd you say, seven point nine? Yeah, it's a seven point nine, so it's oh, a little okay, on the heavier good. side. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy responsibly. <laughs> All right. Uh, next thing. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, Jeffrey Lurie got asked plenty about Nick Sirianni, the decision to retain him, the process that went into deciding how he came to that decision expectations for him going forward, et cetera, et cetera. And he kind of did what you thought he would do, <laughs> which was, you know, kind of point to, you know, the idea that not the idea, but the fact that they went to the playoffs in each of his first three years. Um, he actually even kind of cherry picked a certain. Yeah. I love this. I love this to point. a certain end point 
Well, we were 31 like, and 7. Whoa. 31 and 7. Okay. With, uh, <laughs> which, which was, uh, I guess, a, a time frame between some point in 2021 where like when they, they started to turn it around they're probably like two and two and seven no two and five at that point i Shane guess Steichen takes over the play calling yeah and then of course the 2022 season is what it was where they were just romping through everyone and then the first <laughs> they are they're the kings of like taking a legitimately good stretch <laughs> like in 2022 and then yeah. fixing other parts onto that right to take right, credit right. for more things then i hate it so much <laughs> i hate it yeah, so he, he cherry picked a, a very specific timeline of and he came up with the Eagles had a record of 31 and 7 during that stretch, which certainly 31 and 7 is amazing <laughs> to have, you know, to win 31 games in a span of 30, 31 games in a, in a span of 38 games is very good, but it's also very cherry picked. And and to be you know, to be fair, he absolutely acknowledged how bad the stretch was at the end of the season. And I remember like watching, you know, it's like seeing his reactions during the games mm -hmm. where he looked pissed. And then like, even like after the playoff game against the Bucks, I saw him coming through the tunnel and, you know, into and into the locker room and he looked pissed then too. Mm -hmm. So he's an owner who cares a lot. He's, you know, he hammered that home on Tuesday uh, when he talked that he cares a lot and he does like, certainly he cares uh, a lot about the success of the team. I think probably more so than most of the owners in the NFL um, right up there at the top of the, of the league, in my opinion, in terms of owners that definitively want to win, sure. um, which isn't the case with it, with every owner. And um, ultimately what he arrived at with Nick was that he had a lot of success with him, but Nick came in with Howie and pitched what their plan was going forward. He bought what he was selling need to bring in the best possible offensive coordinator. He said, his, uh, Lurie said that Nick's first choice was Kellen Moore. Wow. Um, how convenient his first choice is the same <laughs> guy. The Eagles wanted to hire as their offensive coordinator when Doug Peterson was still the head coach. <laughs> right. And who they brought in for head coaching in, 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 before uh, they hired Nick Sirianni. Yeah, wow. What a coincidence. So that's what he said. He said it was Nick's first choice was Kellen Moore. And then of course, you know, Vic Fangio had been, I mean, he, he credited Nick for Vic Fangio, but like, come on, like <laughs> we we know that they've been wanting Vic Fangio for a very long time now. Uh, let, let's not let's not you know put that on on Nick. But uh, the thing that I thought that stood out just in terms of their you know meetings before, and he and he certainly acknowledged that there was uh, that he, he had there was a decision to make. Like it wasn't just, of course, we're bringing him back because of the three years that he had so far and feel like he acknowledged that there was a decision to make, but he ultimately brought him back. Um, and that the, you know, because of his record and, and whatever, but I think the one thing that stood out to me was that Nick didn't make any, any excuses to him, um, yeah. took accountability for, you know, what happened at the end of that season, of course. So, um, I don't know. There's not, if there's you know, a whole lot to take away from that. Mm -hmm. Elliot asked if Nick was on the hot seat heading into the season. And, um, you know, certainly if he had been asked that a year ago, it would have been like, <laughs> what? Like, seriously, GTFOH, dude. But after the season they just had and the decision whether to retain him or not, of course he's on the hot seat. Of course he is. And his answer reflected that. He was basically like, well, every head coach in the NFL has all kinds of pressure on them to perform. <laughs> so, you know, basically with that answer, he was confirming that, yeah, Nick Sirianni is, you know, very, very much squarely on the hot seat heading into 2024. Um, and if he doesn't perform, he's probably going to be replaced by somebody either already on the staff or outside of it. So I've been having some big picture thoughts about the Eagles, which I think I'll use this, what we're talking about as a jumping off point for that. And I feel like I'm of two minds, as I often am, more than one thing can be true. But I think like I've, I've been feeling like, okay, uh, I'm, I feel, I've, I felt relatively more, I felt I was pretty down at the end of last year. Obviously I thought things were bad. I thought they should have fired Sirianni, but my pessimism wasn't so much about carrying into 2024. I do. I've never thought like, oh, they can't rebound. I think a lot of things point to them rebounding in that. I still believe in the talent. I still think you have a lot of good talent there. I like the coordinator hires. Um, they have one with Sirianni before. 
the Cowboys are not just so primed to easily repeat considering no one repeats as division winners and they haven't even done any. They've only gotten worse this off season so far. So in a lot of ways, I feel kind of like almost bullish on the Eagles, but I think I'm, it's to a, it's only to a point. I think I'm bullish on them, like winning the division, being a good team, rebounding a bit from last year. Side but note, Dallas has had a rough off season so far. For sure. Side but note, yeah. I think it comes to a point where, and you know, I, I talk about all the time how Sirianni like wouldn't go for it in the Super Bowl, and I think some of Sirianni. I don't think Sirianni's flaws are enough to prevent the team from having a good year, like being better or whatever mm-hmm. in twenty twenty four. But I do think they ultimately will hold the team back from achieving the whole, like the biggest goal of them all, and he's not going to give them an edge in that regard. And I think that's a big issue. And if you're another team rooting against the Eagles is exactly kind of where you want them to be in a spot where they're good, but not quite good enough. Um, So that's my biggest fear is that they kind of are going to have a bit more of a cap on them because I think their head coach isn't going to give them every kind of edge. And that doesn't mean you can't win a championship with that guy. The Rams won a Super Bowl with Sean McVay when he's a total coward and won't go for it at all. But, (laughs) you know, it makes it a lot harder. Um, Andy, for that matter, isn't like, isn't, super aggressive in well, those as you and i talked about yeah at the end of the super bowl not going for or taking one more shot into the end zone there yeah. could have been, that was insane uh but yeah anyway so i'm not like out on sirianni in the level of that i think the team's going to be a disaster next year i don't think that as much i do think they're going to be good but i am highly skeptical he's going to give them the edge to ever be the championship team okay um nick's press conference uh, he got asked a few questions, but first of all, Nick was like, not very revealing about anything. <laughs> like that was a, that was a, t- that was a tough press conference to have to, first of all, let me, let me just take a, take a step back. Here's mm-hmm. what happens at the NFL. Yeah, set the meeting. scene. You're there in Florida. Yeah. So here's what happens. Uh, Monday, the first thing, the first event that happens at the NFL owners meetings on Monday, is Monday morning, seven 45 the AFC coaches talk. Okay. So they're all at these round tables in this big conference room. And, you know, there's like seven, eight chairs at each table. The, mm-hmm. the Philly, the Philadelphia tables always, this, we're talking about AFC here, but just to set the scene for the Eagles table, the Eagles table is always overflowing with, with us. Like, uh, we're like we always have way more writers there than any, than any other team in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Uh, other, you look at other tables and there's like four empty chairs and you're like, come on, <laughs> it's not, that's not fair. But anyway, um, that's the first thing that AFC coaches, I don't really, I don't have much use for that personally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Robert Sala got asked about, you know, Bryce Hoff, uh, Shane Steichen got asked some questions from Eagles reporters, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, no, we don't really care that much about, about that Monday night. Oh, so sorry. Sorry. Also how he talks to us typically on Monday as well. So but that's, that's and that doesn't get streamed. Unlike the Nick and right. literary things. That's just the people who are he just he's talking to, to that are there. Yeah. Um, and Monday night, there's a huge party where it's an open bar. There's like buffet style food. Food's ridiculous. Like what did you have? Bar. I didn't I actually didn't have any food. I had a huge lunch. I just wasn't hungry. So I barely, ha- I didn't really have anything at all. What do you eat for um, lunch? I had a big burger and a giant plate of fries. <laughs> From where? Like down. <laughs> What's that? that? There? Uh, yeah, actually at the, uh, actually mm. at the, uh, at the at the okay. hotel that it was at. So it's two hotels. It's JD uh, Marriott there and uh, the mm. Ritz Carlton. They're connected and it's just a huge place. Anyway, at this party, you know, my plan is my, I've gotten wrecked at that party before. So my plan was to go in <laughs> and just have like four or five beers. And yeah, I wait. And to, to be clear, four or five beers would, you know, do some damage to a lot of people. I weigh like 215. Okay, I can handle four or five beers. But that was the plan going in. But these these NFL people, they had an old-fashioned bar. They had a bar dedicated to just making old fashions. Mm. And it's like, come on. Wow. So now my hands are tied. I have to have a bunch of those. Like, there's no other way. I have like, to. <laughs> like, you're going to have an old-fashioned bar. I'm going to have some old fashions. Like, there's just no way around it. So the NFC roundtable thing is always on Tuesday. It's just not mm. fair that they they don't they don't ever switch it up. They never have the NFL on Monday when everyone's right. fresh. It's always the day after that party. It's always 7:45 and it's mm. 
and you're competing get against like 14, you know, other Eagles beat writers who are getting there sometimes at like 630, like more than an hour in advance to get a chair Jeez. to make sure they have somewhere to sit. And like, so you got to get there really early, super hungover. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then that's when you get Nick and Nick, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't say Nick, but a lot of the head coaches even at this thing you know, mm-hmm. hung over as well. Don't really want to be there. Aren't super enthused about. Why do they it, schedule it like this? Make it, it, it's crazy that they schedule this. Also, like if you're going to have this party, maybe you don't have the event at 745. That's what I mean. Like they can't push that back at all. Like, can't really? can't at and, you know, right. 11. It's it's so annoying how they have this set up every year. In, in what is otherwise by far the best off-season event of the year. That's so silly. It's like, oh, we have to do it this way. <laughs> do you really? You can't yeah. adjust it? <laughs> so Nick uh, Nick talks at 745. You know, everyone's, yeah, I wouldn't say everyone, but most of the people there have, you know, have imbibed a little bit the previous night and uh, a little sluggish. Of course, that's, that's when the infamous sausage sandwich incident of... Mm. I, I believe that was 2017. Yeah, that was a Doug year. Uh, it was a Doug year for sure, where I, I had made a, a sausage sandwich. <laughs> it was just a bagel and a couple of sausage links in the middle. And Les and McLean, and I think somebody else, somebody else had taken pictures of me either eating my sausage, sausage sandwich or staring at it, <laughs> sitting right next to Doug. Um but anyway, Nick wasn't too revealing in his press conference. I thought, you know, one of the I don't even think it's interesting because I just don't think he was I just don't think he was trying to be helpful really was you know the the offensive line stuff where he mentioned, you know, mm. we'll see what we do at center. We'll see what happens at right guard. I was like, "Wait a second. We'll see what you do at center." Cam Jurgens isn't is he like not definitively the center? And he wouldn't even like acknowledge like, "Come on." Come on, man. Like, of course, he's, it's Cam Jurgens is going to be the center. And then at right guard. Yeah, a little he ridiculous. At, he was, he asked, I think Zach asked him more of just uh, an open-ended question on, you know, who was in the mix there. And he mm-hmm. named some guys but didn't name Tyler Steen. So we were like, what? And then Jeff came in uh, late and said, what about Steen? And then he was like, oops. Uh, I don't know if the oops, I forgot to add him in there. Didn't mean to think. I don't want him to think that he's not part of that mix. Uh, so please add him in, <laughs> please, please. I don't know. If, I don't remember if that was actually during the press conference or immediately after it, but he didn't mention him initially when he mentioned the options. I don't right think guard, that's irrelevant. Uh, that might t- not be intentional, but it might not be irrelevant. Right. Right. So like, whereas, you know, you and I can look at center, we know Cam Jurgens is going to start. We can't look at right guard and say, we know that Tyler Steen is going to start. So mm-hmm. in my mind, they don't know who their right guard is going to be. Mm. They don't, I, and to me, I feel like that guy isn't on the team yet. Whether they mm. take a right tackle of the future slash right guard of the present, or whether they just you look at like their top thirty visits, the like guys that have come in on on like uh, that that they, they get a uh, an in an in person yep. in house look at at draft prospects that visit the Eagles Novacare Complex facilities. Um, a couple of those guys have been guys that play guard only mm-hmm. and don't have much versatility otherwise. So I don't think it's uh, out of the question that they just draft a guard. I don't think they do that in the first round, but I think there's like a handful of guys that make sense to do that in, you know, rounds two or three or whatever. Mm-hmm. Maybe they, they do that and they just have a plug and play starter rookie uh, that they just draft. They just take a guard and they plug them right in a right guard. I mean, I've been saying this all along, like, and I know you agree with me in terms of he's good there. Tyler Steen to me is a tackle. He's not a guard. Like he, yeah. at least he was so good at tackle. I thought he looked so good. And you know, it's training camps, a small sample size, but the stark contrast between how he struggled at guard mm-hmm. and basically never even made it a competition with Cam Jurgens, and the way he looked like noticeably awesome, which also isn't, I feel like easy always for an offensive lineman to do in a practice at all, let alone a rookie doing that. Like, yeah. I wasn't even watching Tyler Steen at certain times and he popped out to me because he looks so good on the move. He looks so natural, such a, a natural mover, if you will, uh, at left tackle that I was like, what? <laughs> just play that guy there. It's a more valuable position anyway. And also you don't have, I guess, surefire swing tackle at this point. Uh, right. Especially mm-hmm. behind Jordan. I mean, you know, could it be Fred Johnson maybe, but like, you know, we haven't really seen a lot of him in real game action. So 
uh, yeah, I would like to see Steen more, honestly, at tackle, and I think he could have a bright future there, but that does beg the question who's going to play at right guard. And, yeah, I do think, uh, I mean, I would say non-zero chance Steen's in the mix there or whatever, but uh, certainly not just, like you said, being handed to him. Yeah, I mean, you, you and I have mentioned um, quite a bit, this is the 65th overall pick uh, yeah. in the draft last year. So, I mean, just outside the second round. Um, and if he's a backup in year two, you know, that's not a great return. It's a great early return anyway. We'll see what he develops into as his career goes along. Uh, but not a great early, early return so far on him, you'd have to say. Uh, but yeah, interesting that that there will be at least competition, theoretically, at that right guard spot for the second straight year uh, mm-hmm. in Eagles training camp. Um, I don't really have much more to add on the offensive line, but um, another thing I wanted to touch on too mm-hmm. was uh, Lurie talking about the demeanors both of Nick and Jalen Hurts, which the Jalen Hurts I think was stuff was a little more relevant, and then also a, kind of a bigger story near like the I guess after the season had ended where. I feel like it was stories by McManus and McLean both put out stuff about um, how he's like his sto- his stoicism was kind of viewed by some as maybe a negative. Well, Lori kind of touched on that where were you going to say something? You can jump in. Well, we like. had Joe, you know, Joe Santa Liquido did that story for BGM. Oh, Joe too, too, yeah. That touched mm-hmm. on some of that in terms. I think some it comes off as aloof, you know, to some. Yeah, and my point in that has been that because um, a lot of the pushback is like, well, you can't like how he was last year and hate how he was this year, and I don't agree with that. I'm not saying he needs to change entirely, but I'm saying like different situations might call for a different approach sometime, and it's not a one size fits all. That would be my argument to that. Yeah, so Lori basically, and I think Lori's right in in his messaging here where he said, you know, um, you can't like you can't be inauthentic if sure. you're just not if you, if your personality is not to to you know be super outgoing and Mm -hmm. and and like you're not you can't fake it because your team he didn't say this part but this is me interjecting your teammates are gonna like they're gonna identify that in half a heartbeat and they're just not gonna respect you as 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 an authentic person Mm -hmm. so you know if he's quiet and he's reserved and he's and you know that's just kind of the way he's gonna lead it is what it is now whether your preference would be to have uh, a, a franchise quarterback who is you know, more exuberant, more outgoing, um, you know, can kind of, uh, you know, connect with, you know, players all over the roster, offense, defense, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, lead that way. I I think that's probably maybe preferred, but you can't force it. He, like, he just, he just is what he's going to be and you let him do it. Like you, and, and Lurie made the point, like, Mm. (laughs) and this is actually kind of true. Like, I feel like this is kind of like a, a thing that you say that it's, you know, you're just kind of making something up that, that wasn't really said at the time. But I actually think this is this is right. When they were like 10 and one, there was kind of a narrative that like, oh, they're winning because they're running all these close games uh, because Jalen Hurts is calm, steady hand and, you know, his stoic nature. And he's nothing either. He's unflappable, like nothing, right. like no, nothing, nothing, you know, mentally can can stop him and blah, 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 blah. And that's kind of true. Like I did hear stuff like that uh, at that time. And mm-hmm. then they have that losing streak at the end of the year. And it's like, he's too stoic. <laughs> you know, so like, you know, I kind of get his point on that. Sure. But I think I think his greater point that you can't change who somebody is and expect it to work. And he said the same thing kind of for Nick, but the, in the opposite way where Nick has this huge personality and is extremely demonstrative on the sideline and in the locker room, we saw him like getting into screaming matches at some point with players, uh, near, uh, you know, down the stretch at the end of the year, Son Reddick being one, um, in, I forget who the others were, uh, but you know, that he was asked whether you want him to kind of dial it back a little bit. And he actually said a little bit like, you know, he, he needs to kind of find a sweet spot of you know being who he is but also not going over you know over the top uh with that but again he went back to the point that you got to let these guys be who they are or you know the the your your teammates and and your players who are playing for you around you are just not going to respect the fakeness 
Yeah, I think it's a bit of a straw man. I don't think people are asking him to be total Jalen Hurts specifically to be totally different. I don't think, or at least reasonably, I don't think that's what's reasonably being asked of him. And by the way, not just from a general public, but the Eagles themselves clearly leaking that, like they did at the Super Bowl when they said they want Jalen Hurts to be a bit more open, and they enjoyed how he was at the Pro Bowl when he looked like he was like having more fun. I do yeah. think there are things that Jalen Hurts can tweak in that regard. Where, yeah, like. I don't think you have to change the calculus of your whole personality, but like maybe look like you're actually having fun out there for once. Like, I don't <laughs> think that's a big thing to yeah. ask for. Or when, like, you know, I think of some moments like when the end of the Seahawks game, why did AJ Brown have to come out and say that Nick Sirianni took the bullet for us? Why couldn't Jalen Hurts after the game say, Very hey, fair. guys, for sure, I, that was on me? Because that's like, that's good leadership. Very that's fair. saying, I made, I made the check, I made the call there, I went against the play, that was my bad. I take the blame. Like, why can't he say that? Like, that's that's what a players typically like to do, even if it's not their fault. They like yeah. to, that's what a good leader does. You take the accountability because also at that point, it okay, you talk about it for a little bit and then it's gone. Like, but he didn't do that, and then it festered, and then the AJ Brown thing came out like a week after because it was kind of this like secret thing. Like, why and, and then after the season, when Jalen Hurts is asked about like, do you want Nick Sirianni back? Or I forget exactly what the phrasing was at the time, but basically like a very tepid endorsement of that. So Mm -hmm. Uh, I do think there, I don't, and I don't think you have to change Jalen Hurts' personality to expect better of him and expect better leadership of him in those kind of situations. I don't think he was always the leader that he could have been ideally. And that's not me. I don't feel like being contradictory because he was, you know, a similar way in 2022. Again, the circumstances were different. They were so good that I think his style worked because it kind of tempered things down and it made sure they didn't get too ahead of themselves and think they were God's greatest gift to the world and kind of get a, let that run away from them. But when you're going through it and you're going through a tough stretch, again, maybe there's an adjustment that kind of needs to be made there. And I think truly the great players, and obviously let me qualify this with what happens on the field matters most. How he actually plays matters way more. But um, when a team's going through a stretch like that, I think, you know, the best of the best kind of find a way to break that and like, don't let that slide kind of happen. They put the team on their back. I think not only on the field, but also kind of, uh, an attitude and spirit. I think of, and now this is like an all time kind of leader example to kind of compare to in a different person. But like, I feel like that kind of slide doesn't happen last year. Let's say if Malcolm Jenkins is in that locker room, like yeah. I don't think he would stand for that. He just wouldn't. And maybe they're, they're lose. Obviously again, talent is part of it. But just the mentality, I think it looks would be different. different. Even if they continue yeah. to lose, it just looks di- it looks exactly. a little bit different. Yeah, they don't. I don't think they look as lifeless as they did by the end of the season. So, um, and that's you know, again, that's a lot to ask for Jalen Hurts to be Malcolm Jenkins. But I think there's a bridge to gap from what he was last year and Malcolm Jenkins, and I think he could get a little bit closer to that. And I think that's what kind of people are asking for. They're not asking for a total personality reshape and for him to yell at everyone, but I do think he kind of needs to step it up a little bit, just like he needs to get better at whatever, like, you know, accuracy, you know, as as part of his game. It's all part of the equation here. I think there's room to improve, and I think that's a fair criticism and fair to point out he could be better in that regard. Okay, well said. A uh, couple throwaway things, not throwaway things, but um, just the smaller things. Uh, Lurie and the Eagles were, I mean, not Lurie, but the Eagles in the NFL PA player poll, which is very fun to read if you've ever, if you've ever seen that, uh, where basically the players rate all the teams in terms of like a lot of different categories, like, you know, do they like their head coach? Do they like the treatment of their families? Do they like how the team, you know, like the, the, the travel? Do they like the team's facilities, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera? They're graded on like eight or nine different categories, something like that. Um, the Eagles finished 14th overall in that a year ago. This year, fourth, moved up 10 spots, fourth in the league. It's pretty good. And one of the areas where they scored very poorly last year was travel, which they got a D from the teams, uh, from, from, from their players. Um, and I guess it was because they didn't, they don't have, they don't like allow players in first class. And the reason they do that evidently is because they don't want to pick players who deserve to be in first class. And then the others <laughs> that, that don't, which I understand. So what did they do? To, and they actually still only got a C, like they only moved mm-hmm. up a letter grade in this category. So like, but I think what they did was they tried to, tried to, they, they saw mm-hmm. criticism and they tried to make it better, which I think is a legit thing. But so what they did was they they now charter two planes 
so that all the players I and mean, nobody no, still nobody gets to sit in first class because again they don't want to have to make some players feel like they're mm-hmm. less important than other players but they now have two planes and now guys get their get the row entirely to themselves not bad i'd like I, to have I, my I own row a, Thompson, I, a whole row sounds amazing to me <laughs> right so that's pretty good and um i, I kind of credit them for and you know, you know, I don't know that these kinds of things lead to wins, you know, more wins or, or whatever. But I think when you know you're pitching a player in free agency to come play for you, it's a point that you can make. You can be like, yep. "Yo, dude, we're like fourth in the NFL in player happiness." Sure. Um, and you and we, you can they can point to improvements that they make and blah blah blah, blah whatever. Um, whereas you know, look at a team like the Commanders that finished last in the NFL a season ago, and then they finished last again this year. They signed a lot of guys this offseason, but they also signed a lot of guys for a lot more money than they probably should have made uh, this offseason. So I don't know. Um, I think that it's they, they do a very good job of trying. Lurie, particularly, does a very good job of trying to make his organization. The, the, I'll use his words as top notch uh, in every area as possible. And, um, and I, and I think he means that. And, um, you know, some, sometimes those little things do matter sometimes. Uh, like if you, if you're competing with the commanders, for example, for a free agent and all things being equal, you're probably going to go to Philly instead of Washington. You know what I mean? Uh, I have a question for you, but we'll get to that on the other side of the break here, which okay. we'll take right now after you send us to break back after this back here on BGN radio which, in addition to Right to Sell and Craft Turkey and Wrong Crowd Beer Company, it's also brought to you by Christian Roach of Roach Shoulders. If you're looking to buy, sell, or rent a house, what do you do, Jimmy? 856-906-9295 is where you can reach her to buy or sell your home. Spring market mm-hmm. coming up. Actually, probably already already started. Spring um, has sprung. Spring has sprung. Yeah, when, did spring, when was spring? Was that March 19th? I think like, yeah, a week or so ago. Yeah. But that's when a lot of houses start popping up on the market. So if you're just curious, even if like what your house would be, could, you know, could sell for, you can do like market analysis of your house, show you home comps, like home, other sales of similar um, homes like yours in your neighborhood or area or whatever, and give you an idea of what your house would sell for. If you put it up on the market, et cetera, et cetera, no charge for that. So anyway, reach out to her 856-906-9295. So my question for you, Jimmy, that I teased before the break which is kind of funny. It's not like a radio show, an actual radio show, you know, live where it's like, oh, I have to stay tuned. I have to stay through the ads after the break. <laughs> you can kind of just skip through. But yeah, uh, nevertheless, I did it. And it's a genuine question. Because uh, I asked this to RJ on the mixtape this week, and I wanted to get your take on it. Like, how would you rank the NFC East owners from best to worst? Lori, it's clearly number one to me. Agree. Jerry Jones. Wow. Although he's he's uh rough off season for him. He it's been a really rough off season for him. But I think, you know, body of work, sure. I'd still probably take him. That's fair. <sighs> the others the two others stink. Yeah, but you, you have good. to you have to do it. This, and I know Harris is the... bad too. Um I'm gonna go Josh Harris and then I think that's then, fair. And then John Mara. RJ put Mara one. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Cause he, I think he got, he got caught up in, uh, he likes Mara, how, uh, how honest Mara was. You remember that video of like how that Mara kind of had a season or so ago where it was like, we, we sucked. Like he was brutally honest about yeah. where the giants were. Um, so I think he liked that a lot, but yeah, insane ranking to have him. Number one, very, how about pay, how about pay your players, you know, how about, how about spending some cash? And maybe kicking the can down the road at least. Like how they let Xavier McKinney just leave right. is insanity to me. Yeah, they don't have any good players. You're gonna let like one good player you have let out the door. Right. Over, you, you can tag them for 17 million. Yeah, and, they could have done the transition tag they, at the very least and let you know, like have an opportunity to match it, right? Pay it up front and then you know, kick the can down the road on the cap on that. Insane that that I mean, it's because of the owner. The owner's gonna put it put up cash well, up front. I think it's also part because I think some of the struggles with that organization has been the co-ownership too, you know, the Tish family as well. You know, I think that's a, 
it's a dynamic a lot, a lot of the teams have where they have the, the the two owners yeah and i think sometimes there are conflicting visions of what they want so i think there's like compromises that get made there but then you don't have a cohesive vision and i think that's actually been a big issue with the giants especially and I, I remember with like the eli stuff so if i'm not mistaken like one of the owners kind of wanted to move on from him and the other one was like really nostalgic and didn't want to uh-huh. so that kind of created like you know a rift there so uh <laughs> yeah I, so it's not even just mara it's i think that the, the the both of them, that structure, I just don't like at all. So yeah, uh, they're What's definitely. Your order? I said Harris number two in part because Jerry Jones has had a really bad off season, and we can cut, set our watches to the Cowboys being disappointing every year. Yeah. So I know they've had you know like regular season success, and also not because I think Harris is great, but I think because uh, because he is like kind of unsullied. You know what I mean? He hasn't proven to be awful yet. I'm just right. gonna give him the upside. Uh, and like, you know, look, uh, do I think he's been the perfect Sixers owner? No. Has he done some good things? Sure. He hasn't been like, he hasn't been a, an F minus Sixers owner. He has not been an A plus Sixers owner, but he has done some positive things. And I think I like the commander's trajectory. I don't love it, but I like it more than I dislike it so far. But yeah, it's not so much about an endorsement of him as an indictment of the okay, others fair. behind him. And I think glory is at number one. Um, I think I had some other potpourri of topics before you get to anything else you want to. We should mention real quick, the Eagles actually made some signings last week when we didn't record. So yeah. We did a double episode last week. We did two hours. Two hours. Um, Tyler Hall, they added kind of a, unceremoniously. He played for the Raiders. He has experience in the slot. And the way, was it how he talked about him? I saw some of the comments on him. Kind of seemed like not a non-factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um... He'll come in and compete for a backup slot corner job. They don't have a so they don't have their starting slot corner on their roster right now. Whoever that's going to be, right. it's not going to be Tyler Hall. Like Tyler Hall will compete for a backup slot job. And just like so, they felt like they didn't have enough in reserve at that spot last year, and certainly they didn't. And and Clearly. to be fair, like they lost their backup before they lost their starter. Like they lost Zach McPherson during training camp. Yeah, they lost their top yeah. two options there. And right. um, you know, thereafter they didn't. They just didn't have success filling in that filling that in with anyone. And they tried. They tried a lot. They of did. They things. tried like six different guys. So mm-hmm. uh, and none of them worked. And, I'm, and some of them got hurt. Right. So <laughs> tough corner. Tough, 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 tough season in the slot. Uh, mm-hmm. And then and then of course opposing teams are just putting their best receiver in the slot and then wrecking them over in the middle. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that's an area. It's it's seemingly an area of focus for them this offseason, but they haven't done anything there yet aside from cut their starting corner, which you know is a no brainer decision mm-hmm. to cut Avante Maddox for what he was making. But um, yeah, they had Tyler Hall, so he's just going to be another guy in the mix to potentially win a roster spot for a backup slot corner job but i don't think he's a candidate to start and i don't necessarily think that you you know he's a lock to make the 53 man roster or anything like that but you know a player that they added hopefully i think you know ideal realistic best case scenario is he's like a better version of josiah scott like a guy if he has to come in and play he won't be like a guy the team literally goes after every single play and it's like oh he's (laughs) just kind of like decent and he's fine right uh they also signed paris campbell who obviously has a connection to the Eagles in terms of being between uh, him and JJ Arthega Whiteside mm-hmm. when the Eagles made that pick in 2019, and then also the connection to having uh, success in Indy. Uh, well, relatively speaking, at the end there more so, uh, and obviously an appeal there, and also has kick returning experience, which is relevant as you mentioned earlier in the show with the NFL's new kickoff, which I'm a I'm a fan of. I'm in favor of that. I that was something when I watched some XFL games when they were on that I liked I thought was like entertaining and intriguing so uh, I'm a fan of that I like a kick return bring back my boy Jason Huntley who was an awesome kick returner in college and I stand for a long time uh he's his value has never been higher than it has been right now in terms (laughs) of having some kind of future uh I don't know where he's at but um yeah anything that you make out of Paris Campbell Isaiah Rogers, by the way, was a good returner also for him. Indy uh, in 2022. Actually, it's his entire career there. He's their primary kick returner there, and he's good. Yeah. He, he had one pump. He had one I kick love return a DB down. kick returner or a punt returner. I just, I just love that for some. I just think it's great. He had it's a fun. high average uh, all three years. I think that he was there, so he could be in the mix for that too. Paris Campbell, by the way, he had the one decent season, like 60 catches, 600 something yards in in Indy. His career. This guy that ran a four. Three one, mm. and his career yards per catch 
I, I don't remember. I think it's nine two. It's nine something. I think it was nine point. It's career yards per catch nine point two for a guy that runs a four three one to have an average yards per catch of nine point two. Like I don't know. Like you, like you see that that all that much like for the speed that he has and just the the like over his career, just the lack of down the field plays that he's made kind of wild. And then last year with the giants his one year there. It was five point something. I think, I think 5.1 yards per catch, which is almost impossibly low. And it's not like it was on like, you know, four or five catches or something like that. He had 20 something catches and he averaged five yards per catch. It's insane. How does that happen? If you have that much, if you have that much speed. Yeah, I mean the Giants' offense was obviously bad, as we know, yeah. with the Saquon thing. And yeah, uh, I think the thing with Paris Campbell, the book on him, and you know, listening to uh, our good friend Johnny Page and Shane Half breaking him down a little bit more on their podcast here on the Shane Page, also on the Bleeding Green Nation podcast network, just like a gadget player, a guy you kind of mix in um, here and there. You know, not so much. I think someone who is like your wide receiver three, definitively, as much as uh, a guy you kind of. Although that's kind of how the Eagles have used their wide receiver three, really. Uh, we should also mention here, no more Quez Watkins. He's gone. All right, Pittsburgh, yeah. Our long national nightmare is over. Uh, Andy Weidel, our f- yeah, former Eagles executive, reuniting with him in Pittsburgh. Good luck, Steelers. Uh, glad he's not going to be back on the Eagles. Um, we were so, just talking yeah. about him at the owners' meetings. I forget who who I was having this discussion with, but they made a good point where they were like, it might have been Elliot, where he's like, this is the exact kind of player. Like, if the Eagles signed him, people would be, like, fired up. Like always, he runs at four three something. He had like decent numbers the one year. You yep. can look at like a few highlights that he's had over the years, like the long catch and run against the 49ers, like the ninety one yard gain. The the play against, um, I think it was the Cardinals, where he took a quick like like bubble screen, took that to the house. Had another one against like kind of a meaningless game against Dallas. Well, he had really one against the Steelers play. in the preseason too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he's had kind of like the a few a few like legit highlight reel moments in the NFL. But and you look at those, you go, oh, wow. And you kind of mm-hmm. imagine that in your offense. I bet that's what Steelers fans are doing right now. Little do they know that uh, mm-hmm. like 90 percent of the time when the ball goes his way, something something not good happens. Right. Uh, it's not that he has zero ability at all. <laughs> yeah. And can't and play. probably a good camp. Like he'll probably go there and have a decent camp. And like people are, like, oh, this guy's going to be a factor in offense. And then probably not. Actually, not in theory. I mean, I don't know what this version of Rush is, and I'm kind of more bullish on him than others, but that part of that's kind of like a bit. Um, in theory, would actually could, could be a good pair with Russell Wilson, at least the Russell Wilson who used to be able to, you know, hit moon balls. Like, that's like like a moon ball, in theory, is what Quez is best at sure. and what Russell Wilson is it. best at. Yeah. So in th- it's very much in theory, though. It's a very much a theoretical proposition more than uh, one base in reality. But yeah, okay. He was also added PJ Mustafer. That kind of seems just like a, a camp body kind of yeah. signing for them. A defensive tackle, more depth on the interior there. Um, Penn State guy. Uh, and I think that's it roster-wise. Well, there's uh, one more thing too. So Jeff McLean broke that. Uh, Jake Rosenberg, yes. who was long kind of like the, um, not the number two to Howie, like you kind of think like the of the number two is like the, the Andy Weidel, Joe Douglas type, but sort of um, the number two in terms of negotiating contracts and uh, the configuration of contracts and sort of the creative things that they've done uh, cap wise over the years. He's leaving for TBD. Like we don't know what what he's going to be doing next, but he's not going to be with the Eagles anymore. Um, The Eagles do have other guys in house that, um, you know, uh, have done some creative things to Bryce Johnston, is is a guy that actually was like a participant in like the Eagles message boards back in the day. Also, and yeah, he, like, was a big Eagles, Eagles fan. Cap.com. And then he, yeah, he created EaglesCap.com. Which, by the way, so the way that he structured that site, like you know how like we're we're all used to like when we go on over the cap.com. By the way, yep. is it Spotrack or is it Spot Track? How do you Spot pronounce rack. that? People always get that wrong, or they think it's like Sport Rack, you know, because that's to do with sports, <laughs> but it's not. It's Spot Rack. S O S P O T R A C. I'm looking it up right now, and yes. Okay, so spot yeah. rack. Spot rack. They the way that they have the grid. Very confusing me. They have the grid with like you know base salary, and then uh, you know like uh, I don't know uh, prorated bonus money. You know the the cap, the, the salary, the actually salary cap number for that year. You know what it'll cost to you know cut a guy. 
cap savings. Like the way they have those grids set up, Bryce had that first. Bryce set that up on Eagles yeah. cap way back in the day. I remember. I mean, we're talking like 2010. He had that kind of stuff. I up. think even earlier than that, honestly. Yeah. I think you're and talking then, about like 2008. And over the cap, over the cap does a tremendous job. Like, so like, I don't, you know, uh, Jason at over cap is like amazing at, at, you know, keeping that website going and whatever. Um, but basically they borrowed <laughs> sort of like the same, uh, visual format that Bryce put together that just handled the, he just covered the Eagles cap. And that was like a serious resource for you know, people covering the Eagles back in the day. And then, uh, you know, over the cap and, and, and spot rack have become sort of, um, you know, like almost it'd be devastating if suddenly they were both gone. <laughs> no one <laughs> would know. Yeah. No one would know anything. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Bryce was kind of a pioneer in what those yeah. two sites have become. And I imagine he'll kind of become the top guy in terms of, uh, contract configuration. I don't know about negotiation. I, I, sure. I just don't know, but, um, he, you know, he's going to step up in, into a bigger role, I'm sure, with, with Jake Rosenberg leaving. Jake Rosenberg, by the way, I got to know him a little bit over the years. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Going to, gonna you know, miss seeing him. Particularly, like, he always, uh, on road games, at like home games, they don't they don't sit, like, in the press box. But at road games, they sit in the, he's, he's, he's normally sitting right behind me mm-hmm. <laughs> on, on road games uh, in, in, you know, the opposing press co- press boxes, rather. So, you know, I've, I've gotten to know him over the years a little bit. And uh, you know, t- bummer to see him go. Uh, I think definitely a significant loss. I don't want to downplay it at the same time. This is someone who uh, Harry Roseman has been very close with for a long time. Yeah. I'm sure they've had the relationship. Childhood like, boys. Right. So I'm sure it's not like a blind side. It's not like they woke up today and said, like, oh, by the way, Jake Rosenberg's leaving. Like they've had time. You know, I'm sure I'm sure yeah. these conversations have happened over time where they've had, you know, a chance to kind of prepare for this. That doesn't mean, again, his loss won't be felt or whatever. But it just means it's not like they're getting caught off guard and suddenly like, oh, no, we have no idea how to manage the cap now. Like, you know, I think that's a little extreme to expect that. But I do think anytime you're losing a bright front office member, it's obviously not ideal. And it's something that you have had to deal with uh, in recent years in terms of a brain drain. And Lurie has made it a point in the past to credit Harry Roseman with being able to kind of restock that pipeline constantly and have good uh, other executives kind of filling those roles. So, and I think, as you mentioned, Bryce seems like someone who probably will take on at least some of that responsibility and will be valuable in that regard. So, um, yeah, uh, significant loss, but also uh, credit to the Eagles who have been able to kind of, I think, weather these kind of mm-hmm. things. Anything well, else? that's all I have, buddy. Well, uh, that means you have to give me a final thought. Yeah, uh, like I said, only... uh, so I guess that we didn't mention Hassan Reddick. Oh, I think right. that is something mm-hmm. we should say before you get to that. Actually, yeah, there was basically, you know, I mean, they they all got at. I mean, even Jeffrey got got asked about Hassan Reddick. Nick mm-hmm. did, and how he did, and just totally unrevealing about any of that. Um, basically, mm-hmm. he's under contract. Not going to say much more than that. It was kind of the messaging, unless you have, <sighs> unless you took something away else. Um, no, I just like I just it seems that there was based on the chatter and everything. I think ESPN's Jeremy Fowler was saying that like. You know, it's just kind of an inevitability, and I just think that's, as I've said all along, I just think that's wrong. I just don't think that's great. I don't think that's if you're trying to win a Super Bowl this year, you're a worse team if Son Reddick isn't on your team. So, uh, and Derek Gunn had that re- report, by the way, that said he yes. would play on his current deal. Well, um, if he does, yeah. Was that so much about Hassan Reddick's attitude or the way this is? So this is the tweet you're referring to from our good friend, Derek Gunn, who said Eagles are still deciding what to do about the Hassan Reddick situation. He still wants more money than the Eagles are willing to pay. As of now, if he were if he were to return to the Eagles, he would play for what his contract currently states. So you're interpreting it as uh, yeah, Reddick right. being on board. I meant it. I took it as like the Eagles aren't touching this contract. So yeah, gonna, right. OK, that could be. I, I yeah. probably just misread that. Uh, right. Uh, though, I mean, the way. Technically, it's worded. That's I could interpret it that way, but I right. think what Derek probably meant would was that uh, he would like have he just to want him back. He, he would on have deal. to return on his. And yeah. I mean, really, like the way that the way that um, 
the NFL is set up from the last uh, collective bar- collective bargaining agreement. You can't hold out anymore because it just costs so much. You can't hold out and gain. Exactly. Chris Jones did it last year, but that's a guy that knows full effing well that he's going to break the bank at some point. So who cares? Like you know, and he also said he regretted that. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. So, and but the sound medic isn't on that level. Um, on, I mean, like, like I've said plenty of times over the last few podcasts and like over the last couple of years, that like he's the best player in the NFL, arguably in that 2022 season. If you include the playoffs, like he led the NFL in sacks and forced fumbles. If you include the playoffs and the guys that like, that were even close to him played the same number of games. Like we're also like, you know, deep, like Joe, uh, Nick Bosa, for example, mm-hmm. played the same number of playoff games as Hassan Reddick and Hassan Reddick had him beaten, you know, all those major car- categories. So, um, I don't know. He for whatever reason, just doesn't have the same. The NFL teams around the league aren't valuing the way him, the way that Mm -hmm. he probably rightfully values himself um, for whatever reason. I don't know what that reason is, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, he had a down year, obviously this past year. And there are questions about the way that he maybe played um, for stats, but I don't know, man. Yeah, but then he signed Bryce Huff, who can't he, defend the run <laughs> or the book on him. He's an amazing edge rusher, and I'm talking about Hassan Reddick here. Like, and I'm, like he does, he does the, he does the most important thing on defense that you can ask for at a at an extremely high level. I'm surprised that his mark objectively is, better than almost every other player. I mean, it's weird that he's not getting. I don't know. Seem, seeming seemingly isn't getting. Um, you know, that kind of respect uh, locally and around the league. Uh, what's the lowest you would trade him for? Two. So if it were like a three and something, mm-hmm. a three and like, a five, pfft, no, like a three and a three, maybe. God, so weak, though. I feel yeah, like it has to be a high weak. three. But again, you're saying like, what's the lowest I would trade him for? Yeah. But yeah. like, I mean, if I know that he's like, there's okay. So at this point, to be clear, is what I would the lowest I would trade him for at this point, hmm. knowing that his market isn't as good as we probably would have thought it would be, and then also with all the moves that they've already made, where you have Bryce Huff and you have Josh White and you have Brandon Graham, you have Nolan Smith, and you have Zach Bond and whatever, go right down, right on down the line. If you asked me this before any of that like all transpired, I'd say like a low one, (laughs) you know, like a high, like a really high two is what I would, you know, would be the lowest that I trade him for. But now that things have kind of already happened and you've are like his trade value isn't as high seemingly as we would think. And they've already made all these other moves, you know, recalibrated probably a couple of threes is the lowest I would trade him for, but I'd be certainly gunning for a lot higher than that. I feel like if they trade him, that's just not going to be acceptable in terms of a sell too. And how do you how, how do you sell this to fans? And I, that's not their number one priority, but I think mm-hmm. that is part of the equation. And I think that's not something that Howie Roseman doesn't think about at all, knowing him and knowing you know he's you know aware of how he's perceived and how his moves are perceived. Uh, so I feel like it would have to be something that kind of creates some kind of positive buzz on the return. Mm-hmm. And I think that's either like getting a player back who you can right. kind of be like, well, this is like, you know, a, a good player that we got back or um, maybe pick in a player or uh, although I don't think the player you're getting at that point's not great. Or if there's like a way to kind of package some kind of picks that you already have, like if you could take Redick and I was just, this is just a thought experiment. Um, I looked this up. If you took Redick and 50, the Eagles second round pick they got from the Saints. Mm-hmm. And let's say, you know, what if the Ravens want to add another pass rusher? They just lost Jadavion Clowney to the Panthers. What if they trade for him at 30? And I don't know if the Eagles want to get there at the end of the first round. The value from that is worth a third round pick, a late third round pick specifically. So it's not mm-hmm. even a great return still at that point. But so that's like, that kind of is like making it work where it's not the return that you want it to be. It's the return that kind of might be what it has to be realistically not great. But you sell it as like, hey, we got an extra first round pick, even though yeah. it's not like a true first round pick value because of the swap you gave. We now have the fifth round option that we can use on that down the line. You know, that and the crap. talent pool you're picking from <laughs> is, in theory, you know, like yeah. like way better. And you could you could get someone potentially who falls, like Nolan Smith did last year, right? And you know, it hasn't worked out yet. But so 
I think it would have to be some, kind of something like I that. Think player for, your player for player thing is is probably the the thing that they could would be the easiest thing for. The, like, let's say they traded him for him and a pick, for example, like not a high pick, but him and mm-hmm. a pick for Legereus Sneed. Like, right, that's something that they could sell with Yeah, not going to happen now. Uh, he's right, on the Titans, right. but yes, of course, yeah, something like that. To, but where do you go again? The Titans. Titans. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a little surprising. Like he went so low. I feel like uh, obviously the, the contract was big. Yeah. yeah, the contract is ultimately you know a very big contract, but uh, yeah, the acquisition costs not incredibly high. So. I would. I just think they have to play hardball with Reddick. I really do. They did it with Ertz, who they you know was more of like you know a fr- like a franchise. You know, mm-hmm. had more cachet. I'd say, I'd say in sure. the franchise and everything. So like helped win him a Super Bowl. Yeah, I caught the game winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. Uh, yeah. So I would. I think they have to play hardball with Reddick. I think they. And honestly, um, I don't know that it would really make sense to trade Reddick at the deadline. But I think there's. You know, and and uh, shout out to uh, you know uh, the PHOY show has talked about this too. Like when you look at the deals that have gotten the best value, it's been at the deadline as yep. opposed to right now, where there seems to be this very like soft. I just mentioned it with Sneed. Uh, we mentioned it with Brian Burns in the past, and how that wasn't a good precedent for the Reddick situation. Mm-hmm. I think the the market's too soft; it's not worth it. But there could be a situation maybe that arises, like just like it was. It was not the, certainly comparable with Ertz because they probably could have gotten more if they traded him in the offseason as opposed to when they did because they kind of hung on for him a little too long there. Uh, but I think maybe in theory, your best shot at getting the best value for him could be at the trade deadline. Although I just would not trade him, I would hold on to him. I'd play hardball, like you said. What's he going to do? Hold out? Okay. He's, he's going to come back eventually. Or. If he sits out the whole year, then I think that's worth it. I think it's, it thinks that's that's worth. I'd rather take the risk that uh, he might come back than it, if he sits out the whole year. I'll live with that. Is what I'm trying to say. If that's really yeah, what no, he wants to do, nobody's ever going to do that again after what happened to. Exactly, uh, it's not going to happen. Um, who was that? The, the running back. Uh, yeah, on the Steelers. How am I forgetting his name? Who Le'Veon Bell? Le'Veon yeah, yeah, so. If, but it, I'm saying if that's the worst scenario, scenario, if that happens, then I live with that. I say that's fine. I, I, it was worth it to play hardball with him and try to get him to come back. So I just don't think there's a way that you trade him for a third round pick and that's like a good move for a team trying to win a Super Bowl this year. I just don't think that's smart. Yeah. Um, on the trade deadline point, the other, the other part of the year where you can get a good return is right before the season, too, where, yeah especially if a team like loses a guy in training camp or preseason game or something mm-hmm. like that gets hurt, like Sam Bradford, for example. I mean, <laughs> the trade that the Eagles pulled off for him is kind of Thanks. legendary. You know, the, the, the you know, guy, get, you know, big time team, a Super Bowl contender. Obviously, they probably wouldn't trade with an NFC Super Bowl contender, but let's say an AFC team has some uh, major injury. Yeah, so I'm ready to them, and you probably get a better return then than you might now. And Reddick could do a hold in, you know, where like he kind of he he shows up to camp, but he's not really practicing as a fake injury, yeah. and he kind of just stash him away like that a little bit. And I think that's that's all worth it to me. Trying to make it work is worth it to me. Trading yeah. him for a meager return is just not even close to being worth it. To he's me. a pretty like I, I, my interactions with Hassan Reddick, smart guy, like really nice guy. Yeah. Um, is not authentic it's never, it's never struck me as like any kind of like um you know difficult personality to deal with like or never delusional struck me that way at ever ever and um you know so i think he could possibly be reasonable about it too they can have a sit down with the team mm-hmm. like try to play ball with us we're, we're trying to get you paid and also you know on a team that you can be happy um but that's going to be impossible if the situation turns ugly <laughs> and you know we're, right. and we're and we're not gonna we're not just gonna give you away for nothing so if it does get ugly then it probably means that you know you, you won't go anywhere um so i don't know um he, he seems like a totally reasonable person and it's a weird situation because again like you i just keep him because i mm. think he's awesome i think he's an awesome player and a good guy and in a premium position <laughs> i don't know it's, it's and weird. like think about how stacked your pass rush is and there's enough snaps for all those guys especially coming off a year where they're all playing too much. Yeah. But like, you're really, you're going to have this issue where you played guys too much last year and then you're going to get rid of one of your top guys. And now you like, are going to find yourself in the same boat. Like that's so stupid. Like none yeah. of it makes sense to me. I just don't get it. If you're going to yeah. trade someone it should have been Josh sweat and he didn't do that. Uh, and I would not trade his son. Reddick. 
basically, right. unless you're getting a beat you over the head pick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or offer. Um, yeah. Now, sorry. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I just love the owners' meetings. It's always in a, it's always, a, it's always in a warm location. Uh, this year, of course, Orlando. You know, Phoenix. A lot of years. It's been in you know Palm Beach. Um, one of the real perks of covering the NFL is going to that every year. Mm. And it's one of those events that I go to every year and I go, okay, um, you know, I don't think I take my job for granted, but as a reminder, don't because like, you know, so some of the, they had an old fashioned bar, dude, they had a bar that just made old fashions only. You're still thinking about this and they were good. You always be thinking about this. <laughs> So it's just kind of a reminder. Eh, eh, you had a pretty good job. Don't screw it up in some horrible way. <laughs> That's uh, my final thought. And if you want to get into that industry, Jimmy will give you more than happy to give you advice. And I feel like yeah. that's true. I'm not just doing that. Oh, for sure. So like people have emailed me before and I'll give them my phone number and I, I'll have, you know, basically what I just do is I say, hey, I give them my story about how I, you know, got in and they can take, you know, there, there are a million different ways to achieve whatever goals you're trying to uh achieve um all i do is kind of give them my story of how i got in and whatever right. takeaways you can take from that then god bless yeah i mean you definitely helped me over the years i mean you literally you like <laughs> i have my job in no small part to you and your counsel so yeah oh, thanks appreciate buddy. that well it's true i mean uh you know when i was just but a mere commenter at BGN <laughs> right. and fan shotter. Uh, Young I remember, back in the day. You, well, you advocated for me, and that was important. And then yeah. it's over the years, too, that you've given me good advice, especially when there was a time where, um, you know, I, BGN wasn't necessarily going to be able to be a full-time thing, or at least that's my was my perception. Mm -hmm. And I was applying to other things, and uh, you gave some good advice on what to do about that. And I feel like what I did worked. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. You got it, buddy. Uh, my final thought is go Phillies. As you see, if you're watching oh, yeah. the YouTube, Opening day. YouTube version, I am. I was supposed to go today. Uh, they, you know, they moved. What time it, is that, by the way? I, I totally forgot about that. Three oh five or something like that. Oh, so it already started. No, tomorrow. It's uh, oh. they oh, they no, postponed today. it. Well, they it was. Oh, and then oh okay. The weather. They they moved okay. it. So they always, for those who don't know, quote unquote, inside baseball, a little literally here. Uh, they always schedule the day off after the opening day in case there's a rain out on the opening day. So they can just okay. move it back as opposed right. to, you know, like scheduling it after total to do a new thing. So, yeah, uh, I'll be going tomorrow. Shout out to my good friend, Matt, former BGN radio host here. Our good friend, Matt, um, he hooked me up with the tickets. So going nice. to opening day to see the Phillies hopefully beat the Braves who they own. They're in their heads. Love to see it. <laughs> Um, really hope so much in the regular season, but in the playoffs, when it matters, well, that's when it matters most. <laughs> what's let's get your Phillies. I know some people get mad when they talk baseball, but whatever. Uh, I mean, your... we're what a, an hour 21 and yeah. more than yeah. that. In the pod. Uh, uh, there's a YouTube commenter at, at least one every time he's like, no baseball talker. It's just like it's, <laughs> you could just like skip that part. It's a podcast, yeah, and also it's like so we don't talk about it for like 30, it's like a 30 minute segment anyway. Just, just hit the button that says fast forward 30 seconds. Uh, uh, so what's your Phillies prediction? Do you think they win the division and where do they finish in the playoffs? And if you so need I time, I can us, go. I have stolen us a series of questions. On I know. Yeah, I heard this. He had, the winning, he had the winning the world series. Uh, what's the over under for them on I it? Is it 91? I, I think it's 91. Um, I think that's what stolen us said during that episode. I'll go over on the wins, mm -hmm. but do they win the um, division? No, I think the Braves will win the division. And I think, uh, I think they get hot again in the playoffs, and I think they lose in the World Series. Oh, tough. It's really – it's hard to reconcile how they lost last year. Like, it's just <laughs> – it makes no sense, right? Like, it's just like there's no good reason for them to be up 2-0, have like the best home field advantage in baseball by right. far, just needing two more wins, and then you can't beat the, the Diamondbacks who like just weren't good. They weren't that – not that good of a team. Not yeah. like – like, you know, when they lost to the Astros, it was like, okay, that team's like – great and yeah, they're cheap. Stacked. yeah of course so yeah. the fact that they even made it as close as they did honestly was like impressive and honestly like that's as far as they could have realistically Especially after beating teams like the braves like oh we'll get this <laughs> crap team by comparison we're gonna wipe the floor with them and then not. right so yeah that phillies run you know it was like okay they ran into a team that's awesome but last year just devastating that they lost to the diamondbacks 
Um, screw it. I'll take them to win the division. I think they seem to be more a little bit more like locked in on that. I think okay. uh, that's not everything. It's not just a matter of like caring about it. But I do think it's more uh, of focus because of how out of it they've been in that regard in recent years. Mm-hmm. And because the Braves, from my understanding, have been like such a juggernaut. Like, they were ridiculously good last year. It's like like obnoxious. It's like 22 Eagles level of good where it's like they can't be that good again. They're still probably going to be really good. But like they can't be that level of good. They're gonna yeah. there's gonna be some natural regression baked in there, and I think the Phillies are gonna uh, benefit from uh, you know the, the World Baseball Classic kind of like slowed them down a little bit in terms of the players who are participating in that. Bryce Harper was hurt obviously coming into last year, if I'm remembering correctly. So mm-hmm. I think they had things kind of working against them, and I think uh, I think this is the year they get it done. They're it's hard to bet against them in the playoffs. Like they're they're just built different. Like when, mm-hmm. for those moments, they're, they're clearly built for those moments. So um, and, the, and the home field advantage is real. It totally is real. real. Yeah. It is very real. Having been there. Um, it's very different than like an Eagles game. Uh, those are not the same thing. Uh, I'm not trying to crap on Eagles hands here, but I'm saying it is like legitimately different uh, from when I've been. So very um, party atmosphere. Yeah. More intense. I would say yeah. more like more tuned to literally every single moment. <laughs> yeah. 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 I uh, get that. At the Phillies. Yeah games yeah uh, and party atmosphere when they're winning of course yes <laughs> so uh okay yeah so i'm yeah phillies win the division they win the nl east they win the world series why not why not believe uh and uh okay this has been bgn radio 387 check out all of our sponsors in the episode description our social media handles all that good stuff as i said earlier like on the video on the youtube page gives a thumbs up subscribe hit the bell notification to get updates when new videos new podcasts drop here on the youtube feed said an episode of the nfc's mixtape come out earlier this week you can check that out with me and rj ochoa i mentioned on the same page um we also have the draft uh position ranking shows going on here uh uh, above the nest with rachel a lot of different episodes here that you can all check out on the bleeding your nation podcast feed as i've said before too we are on the march to 2000 ratings so we want to get that uh steal your friend's phone Leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcast, and that'll be very good for us. It'll make us very happy. We're at 1,955, so we're 45 away. Let's get to 2,000 at some point here, and we'll all feel good about that. As I like to say, the podcast is free, so if you do things like that, which don't cost you anything, it helps make us look good and helps the show keep running. So uh, that's it for this episode. We will be back with you next week to really i guess kind of get into some of our pre pre draft uh things sure. and uh, any eagles news that comes along goodbye everybody <laughs>